Welcome to Dubai. Welcome to the Dubai City Church. We love you and we thank the Lord that the Lord has sent you to us. So come and share the word of God with us. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you so much for your kindness and thank you for the birthday wishes. Uh, well, I mean, uh, there are many more years to come. In Jesus' name. Praise be to God. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm blessed and honored to be here with you, my dear uh, brother Ashish Thomas. I have heard a lot about uh, the church here. I know about his dedication and his wife's dedication to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the invitation came and the opportunity arose, here I am. I couldn't stay away from you. Thank you very, very much. I'm, I'm blessed and I'm privileged to be here among you. God bless you all. And above all, Jesus is here. Yeah. Hallelujah. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We serve a mighty God. Yeah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Thank you very much. My background is German. I am a German national. My ancestors come from the East in Germany, which is thickly wooded. Uh, I'm talking of pre-war um, times. And uh, my family didn't serve God at all. They didn't know the Lord. One day as a young man, I studied the family album, the family tree, and discovered that my ancestors we are ungodly people, except for my grandfather and my father. So I said to my father, how did God break into the Bonke family? And the story my father told me struck me. He said in 1922, my grandfather was very, very sick. He had a disease sensitive to touch, rheumatism or gout or who knows what. But every time he had to move or was touched, he screamed. He was writhing in pain. There was no hope. There was no help. There was no medical help. And they didn't know Jesus. And the whole village could hear him scream day and night year after year and then in 1922 a miracle happened an american missionary lost his way in the forest and came to the village and instead of complaining that he had lost his way his first question was is there anybody sick in this village Oh yes, they said, here's somebody very sick, right here in the bonky house. When that man, his name was Louis Graf, entered the house of my ancestors, he entered it like a burning torch. He preached the gospel. My grandfather, my grandmother received Jesus Christ. And then he said, the Holy Spirit has sent me for a demonstration of the power of God. He took my grandfather by the hand and said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Heavenly power flowed through my grandfather. He jumped out of bed, shaking like a prisoner watching his prison walls fall and his chains were struck off his his aching body he touched his wrists they were no more thick and swollen they were supple like those of a young man Amen. 
He started to cry. He started to jump. He started to run. He embraced his wife. They wept together and rejoiced. And the missionary said, I'm not finished yet. You still need to receive the Holy Spirit. And instead of giving them a long teaching, he had no time to give a long teaching. He laid hands on them and both broke forth speaking in new tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Hallelujah! I was born 18 years later. Because of that happening, I was born to spirit-filled, born-again parents. Yeah. And I feel when that man entered the house of my ancestors, the Holy Spirit put the thread through my needle. He, God, God always prepares things with a long arm. We may not know it, but he does. And I feel in my heart the same Holy Spirit is here to thread many other needles. Hallelujah! My father was a pastor. I grew up in a godly home. I got saved when I was nine. When I was ten, the Holy Spirit spoke to me that one day I would preach the gospel in Africa. I'd never seen an African. Never. There in North Germany, there were no Africans at all when I was a kid. I saw what the first African I saw in the United Kingdom when I was 19 years of age. And I ran to him and I asked him, please, may I have a picture with you? <laughs> I still got that picture. I was very disappointed when he told me he came from the West Indies. <laughs> but it was good enough. I had that call from God. A year later, Jesus filled me with the Holy Spirit. And then through my teenage years, it was a hand of the Lord that guided me until I was old enough to be accepted at the theological seminary. And then finally we went to Africa. And when I arrived in Africa, I found it a very tough place. Nobody wanted to listen to me. I realized Africa had not been waiting for me. Sometimes I preached to five people. I was absolutely despaired. I said, where are the effects of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? This cannot be it. To cut it all short, one night, I had a dream. I dreamt I saw the whole continent of Africa in form of a map with all the islands around Madagascar and the like. And I saw how the whole continent of Africa became washed in the precious blood of Jesus. I heard a voice cry. I'm sure it was the voice of the Holy Spirit. Africa shall be saved. Yeah, yeah. Africa shall be saved. Yeah, yeah. I woke up. I jumped out of bed. I said, Africa shall be saved. I'm struggling in this tiny country called Lesotho. Can't get five people together. And now I hear a whole continent is to get saved. And then I noticed something. I made all these my little plans for Jesus. I had to fast and pray a lot to get his blessing for my plans. And now I realized God had another set of plans. 
And I realized, if I leave my own plans and I connect with his plans, his plans can never fail. Yeah. I left Lesotho, I moved to South Africa, right next to that international airport. I went to Botswana for the first meeting, for the first gospel crusade, because Africa was to get saved. That's, to cut a long story short, that stadium shocked me. I prayed, oh Lord, please fill that stadium. Only one church was prepared to cooperate with me, and the pastor said he had 40 people. 40. And my mind played tricks on me. I already saw myself with 40 people in the national stadium. He said to me, what do you need the stadium for? For 40 people, you can come to my church. I said, God spoke to me. And he told me to rent or hire that national stadium. The first night, there were 100 people. It was more than 40, come on. <laughs> oh, I, I know for sure because I counted 10 times. From left to right, and then from right to left, and then from front to back, and back to front. But 100 is 100 if you count the heads and not the fingers. 100. I took the Bible, I started to preach. And suddenly, I had preached about 10 minutes. Somebody jumped up and shouted, I've just been healed! Wow! I thought by myself, this is funny. I haven't preached about healing. I learned my first lesson. And this was the lesson. I think Jesus oftentimes can't wait until we have finished with our boring sermons. <laughs> He itches to do great things here in Dubai. Yeah. Hallelujah. That night, four people got healed. A blind woman saw, a cripple danced. A few days later, that stadium was packed. It was packed. I learned so many lessons, you have no idea. I have no time to tell you that. But I mean, I've learned so much in the very first crusade that I had. For the first time, I saw 3,000 people jump up, running forward, crying tears of repentance to receive salvation and forgiveness of their sins. That's what. That's, that's what only the Holy Spirit can do. I call the Holy Spirit the master evangelist. Because Jesus said that he and only he, the Holy Spirit, convicts of sin, righteousness and judgment. We can't do this. But when we preach the gospel... The Holy Spirit is in it. He is, he is the hand in the glove of the preached gospel. Amen. All right. Well, I experienced the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Lord said to me one night in the stadium, tomorrow I want you to pray for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I protested. I said, Lord, this is for a prayer meeting, not for a stadium gathering. The Lord rebuked me and he gave me a reason why it was for the stadium. He said, because in the last days, my spirit on all flesh. And if God means what he says, and he always means what he says, 
There is no church big enough. No church. All flesh. That's God's idea. We have to adjust our thinking. Align it with the word of God. And then you will see how the Holy Spirit is going to lift you from face to face. He will be your glory and the lifter of your head. Amen. Hallelujah. After the first crusade, I went to the next one. There for the first time in my life, I saw we had 30,000 people in one meeting. The next crusade, in Cape Town, South Africa, for the first time in my life, I preached to 75,000 people in one meeting. I said to my wife, I was so overwhelmed. I said to my wife, I think this is God's maximum. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit rebuked me in my heart. He said to me, God has no maximum. Hallelujah. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. Our mighty, almighty God. From Cape Town, I went to Blantyre, Malawi. For the first time in my life, I preached to 150,000 people in one meeting. God began to shake cities. And then he began to shake nations. I went to Nairobi, Kenya, Uhuru Park, Buona Sifu Sana, any echo? And uh, 200,000 people were there in one meeting. The state president came. If they phoned me one hour before the meeting started, the state president is going to come. President Arab Moy. I said, he's most welcome, but I haven't got a chair to offer for him. <laughs> We're all standing. They said, don't you worry, he'll bring his own chairs. <laughs> the state president was so moved by what he saw in that meeting, he he commanded that all television and all radio channels were carrying my meetings live across the whole of East Africa. Amen. Are you interested to hear this testimony first? Wow. I was so blessed. Now, from Nairobi, I, I flew across to Nigeria. Nigerians, my favorite people. I, f I flew to the city of Kaduna. For the first time in my life, I preached to 500,000 people. Half a million. I couldn't believe it. But it was a fact. God was now washing Africa Amen. with the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. <laughs> One night when I made an altar call, I'm, I kid you not, I, I, there were 90% of the people who wanted to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. 90%, over 90%. I was so moved when we as team were in the hotel trying to eat dinner. I couldn't eat. I was still filled with the glory of God. I said to my team, do you know what I feel inside of me? They said, tell us. I, he said, tonight I got a feeling that if Jesus keeps saving souls at this rate, I think 
one day the devil is going to sit alone in hell. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I know this is theologically not correct. But I wished it was. I'll tell you why. Because hell was not made for man. Hell was made for Satan and his angels. That's what the Bible tells us. So when I say, when I say what I now say, I want you to know that I'm not swearing. I say to hell with the devil and to heaven with the people. the crusade meetings began to keep growing 700,000 800,000 1 million 1 million 250,000 in the city of Ibadan in one meeting then we came to Lagos for the first time in my life, I preached to a crowd of 1,600,000. Right to the horizon. We have, we have loudspeakers, you can believe me. We have the best PA system anyone can have. It goes miles. I preach the gospel in hi-fi. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. That night I had a revelation. Every time I make an altar call for sinners to be saved, I have tens of thousands of counselors in the crowd. That night when one Point six million people were there. We had 200,000 of them were counselors. We had, we had 30,000 ushers. We had 10,000 police and they got all saved. <laughs> Amen. That night, when, when someone wants to receive Jesus as their savior, they get a follow-up booklet called Now That You Are Saved. That becomes a bridge from the field into the local churches. I'm a great believer in the church. Evangelism must always lead into the church. If not, it's just a show. We counted those cards that night of people who had completed this decision. One million ninety-three thousand. One meeting, one meeting. Hallelujah! We serve a mighty God. I suddenly realized in one meeting Jesus did more then in the 20 years before when I arrived, in one meeting, in one meeting, the gospel is the power of God. And when the gospel is preached, it becomes an event. Somebody said to me, the, your Bible, your Bible, your Bible is not good news he said news i see on television at noon your bible is good history it's good history why does the is the word of god called the gospel is called good news because when it is preached it happens When the gospel is preached, it becomes an event. 
and people get saved. Yeah. Curses get broken. Chains are cut off. Marriages come back together again. The sick are healed. And they say, it's news. It happened now. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm an evangelist. I preach the ABC of the gospel. And I'm proud of it. It doesn't mean that I don't know the X, Y, Z. I do. But evangelists preach the ABC because they have to lead the people from where they are into the arms of Jesus. Through the narrow door into the kingdom of God. Isn't that true? Well, I'm telling you, what God has done is amazing. In the last 10 years, I'm speaking from the year 2000 to 2009. We had 55 million registered decisions for Jesus Christ. 55 million. Oh, hallelujah! Fifty-five million. Huh. I told that in Switzerland. At a pastor's conference in Switzerland. I said, Jesus saved 55 million people in 10 years. And the Swiss said to me, Brother Bonke, that is Africa. This is Switzerland. I said, well, you, you are contradicting scripture. I said to them. They said to me, which scripture? I said, John 3, verse 16. There it says, for God so loved the world. I said, you Swiss have now to tell me whether Switzerland is part of that world. In John 3, 16. I said, if Jesus can save 55 million souls in 10 years in Africa, he could save Switzerland one Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Amen! I want to make you hungry. Hungry for God and for the Holy Spirit. Hungry to go when Jesus says go. Because Jesus doesn't sit with sitters. But he goes with goers. And he works with workers. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We've got to get moving. And he will move with us. Isn't that true? Wow, I've got more to tell you, but I, I have to, I, I, I think I better start with the preaching. Are you blessed? Yes. Hallelujah. What touches my heart here tonight, and I believe the Lord wants me to speak about this. Is how progressively the Lord changed my own understanding of his word. He gave me secrets, which are actually no secrets. But I had never seen it. And I had never heard it preached. And when I was in the school of the Holy Spirit, and he began to teach me, I... I was a totally different man and I wished I could take every one of you by your hand and lead you from B to C or from C to D and you know the alphabet is long but there is a Z there's a Z and the Lord will bless you the alphabet of God is 
from Omega. From Alpha to Omega. Amen. Amen. The beginning and the end. Um, I'm turning to Matthew. I told you already about this. The guy who said the, the Bible is good history, not good news. And you heard me say what, what, I, what I said to him. Somebody else came to me, and a boy of 17 or so, still at high school. He pointed to my Bible when I came out of a meeting and he said to me, Preacher, I don't like your book. I said, why not? He said, your book is 2,000 years old. I didn't tell him it's actually older. He said, your book is 2,000 years old and I am 17. He said, I don't like to live by such an antique book. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, I live today. I want to be modern. There are, there are different rules today. I want to be modern. Ah, I love young people. I've got eight grandchildren. <laughs> I put my arm around him, his shoulder. The sun was shining. I said, young man, have a look at the sun. I said, the sun is also, he's actually very much older than 2,000 years. <laughs> I said, the sun is much older than 2,000 years. But although the sun is so old, very old, it is very hot. <laughs> I said, and the Bible is very old. But it is very powerful. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Now I lost my scripture again. <laughs> Matthew 28. The last verses of this wonderful gospel. And this is what it says. I read from verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And here it comes. Lo, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. Now, I used to preach when I was a young man that this was the greatest promise in the Bible. Until I woke up. And I saw that this is no promise whatsoever. This is a statement of fact. And there is no condition attached. No condition attached. <coughs> Jesus says, I am with you always. Always. This begin to sink into my spirit. I am with you always. And then I realized our prayers are often so wrong. They may be very sincere. I'm not touching on that. And I'm not criticizing anyone. I'm just saying oftentimes our prayers are wrong. Our prayer is wrong. When we as children of God pray, Jesus, please come into our midst. Nobody in his right head will ask somebody to come who has never left you. Amen. And I suddenly began to realize 
I don't need to pray like that anymore. Jesus is with me. I may not always feel him. But my feelings can lie. But Jesus never fails. And when he is with me. As he says. I never need to ask him to come. He is with me right here, right now. It is true. I sometimes don't feel him. Shall I tell you what I do then? Do you want to know? Yes. I appropriate his presence by faith. I say, Lord, here it is written. Lo, I am with you always. Thank you for being here. Thank you for standing with me. Thank you for working through me. The wonderful works of God. This changed so much in my whole approach, even in evangelism. It was not this begging and pleading and pleading and begging. Oh my God. No. I had a firm foundation. I have a firm foundation that Jesus is with us. Yeah. Is, the, is the, the only certainty we have. And many people are so uncertain of this sure certainty. Say, Jesus is with me always. Come on, shout it. One more time. Amen. If that sinks in, we'll never be the same again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is faithful. Absolutely faithful. Let me put it this way. When they married, when young people marry, bride and bridegroom they come to the church they walk through the aisle and there at the wedding altar they make their vow many of you have done it you know how it goes for better for worse <laughs> for richer for poorer in sickness and health all right now I see another picture. I see you and Jesus coming down that aisle, hand in hand. I see Jesus lift his hand. And that, this is what he says. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and health. I will never leave you. Nor forsake you. Jesus will never divorce you. is faithful first and foremost he is faithful to himself because he cannot deny himself he's always the same your maker is your husband this is what Isaiah said and it all fits so beautifully Jesus is with us always amen we may not always have the permanent feeling. We may not always have, yeah, 
What we actually want is to have a permanent feeling that Jesus is with us. But this permanency goes hand in hand with trust, with faith. Faith that appropriates his presence. And once that, you know how to handle that, I'm telling you, you will find him faithful in the biggest things and in the smallest things. He's faithful. And because he is faithful, we can be full of faith. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you blessed? Yes. Wow, I thought so. <laughs> In Africa, I sometimes say, if you don't enjoy my preaching, I enjoy it myself. <laughs> Uh, glory to God. There's another great, great secret. I, 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 let me go to the book of James with you. The book of James. I need to hammer this in a little bit further, okay? Are you in agreement with me? Yes. Okay. Let's go to James. James 1 verse 17. In, in James 1 verse 17, we read every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning or shadow or shifting of turning. One morning, when I was reading it in my devotions on my knees at my bedside, I kept reading the last portion again and again. No shadow of turning. No turning shadow. I said, Lord, what is this? Is this, is this poetry? What, what do you mean? No shifting shadow. Suddenly, I saw something. That had a great impact on my whole preaching, my whole personal life. I suddenly realized that that shifting shadow reference was a reference to the way the people did their timekeeping in those days. They didn't have watches like us. They had sundials. And let me explain to you how a primitive sundial works. It was just a, a circle on the ground. In the middle was a stick. In the morning the sun would rise and the sunlight would throw a shadow. That stick would throw a shadow across the circle. And as the sun was climbing into the sky the shadow began to turn. And by the turning shadow, the people were able to read the time. Now, at one point in the day, the shadow would totally disappear from within the circle. That was when the sun was in noon position right above that stick no shadow no shadow of turning yeah. now our natural sun rises in the morning and sets at night but James wants to say our God Always in noon position. Always. From generation to generation. When I was a youngster, I sometimes thought, what a pity that I lived 2,000 years after the Apostle Paul. He had the full blast of the light of God and I somehow have a patch of shadows. This is false. 
our God is always in the peak position. He's always at the peak of his power and of his glory. Always at the peak of his willingness to save. Always at the peak of his willingness to heal. He is the same today to this generation, to the people today as he has ever been. Every generation has the same chance. Wow! When that hit me, it changed me. It changed me. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. I spoke about marriage altar. Will you allow me one or two more sentences yes. on that subject? Yes. Okay. Young people, listen. The perfect husband is the one who does not expect his wife to be perfect. <laughs> and the perfect wife is the one who doesn't expect her husband to be perfect, but both have a perfect savior. Yeah. Amen! Yeah. I tell you, our God never leaves that perfect position. You have, you have that great, great privilege and honor to be in the full blast of all his blessings. That is true for your business as well in the name of Jesus. That is true for your children as well. In the name of Jesus. No shifting shadow. That means he never moves. He ain't move. He ain't move. You know like that old Texas couple. They were driving in that pickup. And his, they were now old. His wife said to him, Honey, we, we used to sit much closer. <laughs> he said, I ain't moved. <laughs> he always sat behind the steering wheel. <laughs> God doesn't move. If some, anybody moves, it's us. But it's not our glorious God. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. 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 Next thing. This is something wonderful. It is actually John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Now, I've been speaking about Jesus. Now let me speak about the Holy Spirit. All right? Here Jesus announces the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is a chapter, I beg your pardon, is chapter 14, verse 16. It's the verse that is 16. So Jesus is saying here, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever 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 is that really written in the bible yes it's in our bible you see first of all i used to think that the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost because they were all of one accord. They were in perfect unity. And I heard many preachers preach when I was a youngster. They said, this is a precondition for the Holy Spirit to fall. We must be all of one accord. We must all be in unity. 
Wow, then we would have to wait another thousand years. Until I read this, here Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and He will give you the Holy Spirit, that He, the Holy Spirit, may abide with you forever. So Jesus didn't say, you pray. He said, I pray. Amen. We've got another thing we cannot brag about anymore. It's not our unity. It's not even our prayer. It's the prayer of Jesus. Jesus has prayed for you. And the Father will always answer the prayers of His Son. Say Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you receive the Holy Spirit because Jesus has prayed for you. Amen. Next thing. He will abide with you forever. Forever. And here is where there's a big problem in many lives. We think we need new anointings. I don't read anywhere in the Acts of the Apostles that the 120 went back to the upper room for more anointing or for a new anointing because the old anointing had fizzled out. Don't read that anywhere. They didn't go back. Why not? Because they never needed to. The Holy Spirit would be with them forever. How long is forever? Forever is forever. Do you believe it? Wow, that had an impact on me too. That had an impact. I, started, I stopped running after the big anointed people. I thought they were big and anointed. You see, when I travel the world, people come to me and they say, Bonke, lay your hands on me. I want your anointing. Shall I tell you what I tell them? I say to them, are you crazy? Do you really think I give you my anointing and I go home without? <laughs> the truth is, the biblical truth is, I can't even give you my anointing because I'm not the source. None of us is the source. There's only one source. Out of his fullness, his fullness, his fullness, we have all received. Amen. And what he gives will never go. That anointing. Look at David. David was anointed, wasn't he? What happened when he saw Goliath? What do you think? Do you think when David saw Goliath, he turned on his heels, running back to the prophet Samuel, saying, Samuel, I need a new anointing. I need a Goliath anointing. <laughs> Somehow, that young man, or boy, should I say, of 17, knew the anointing. I have received is timeless. Amen. He didn't ask the intercessors to pray for him. He didn't fast and pray. This was the day of action. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With my God, I can jump over a wall. 
This is the moment of action. We can hide in prayer meetings when we should face Goliath. What a tragedy. May God help us all. Isn't that true? Wow. My goodness. He will abide with you forever. 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 Some people say, Yeah, I have been anointed. I have been, received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But, but I have no power. Shall I answer to that? You see, when the fastest sprinter in the world, you're a fan of him. I don't know his name right now. Doesn't matter. Well, God bless him. <laughs> Hussein Bolt. 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 Hussein Bolt comes to visit you. You're a fan of him. You have seen him run. And you are... Just, I mean, you are thrown. Now, Hussein Bolt is coming to your house. You have learned that he likes lemon cake. <laughs> you bake the most wonderful lemon cake you can imagine. You've learned that he likes strong coffee, just black. And everything is prepared, and here comes the sprinter. You offer him the... The, the, the most comfortable chair. You offer him the most comfortable chair. There he sits. He eats the cake. He drinks the coffee. Now my question to you is, when he eats the cake and he drinks the coffee, can you see his strength? No. What? No. no. Because he need, doesn't need it. You don't need strength to eat cake. <laughs> but take him to the stadium. Fire the starting pistol. And you will see him run and say, Oh, what a powerful man. I tell you why most Christians cannot feel the power of the Holy Spirit. Because they sit too much on the chairs in the church. Go out to the highways and byways. Tell somebody about Jesus. And the power kicks in. And you will see the mighty arm of the Lord revealed. Say amen. amen. You see. Jesus will lift you out of the deepest pit. But he will not lift you out of a soft armchair. In Germany we say, you don't carry the dog to the hunt. If a dog needs to be carried to the hunt, leave that old thing at home. We need to get up for Jesus and test these principles. They will work with you as with me. I'm nothing special. I'm a brother among brothers. But I have discovered the resources of God and I draw from them. And we see a whole continent shaken by the power of God. Amen. Amen. I'm an evangelist. I don't apologize for that. I want to leave the 99. And I want to turn to the one lost sheep here. In Luke chapter 13. 
allow me, I will be short. Verse 23, then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Isn't that, isn't that dramatic? Jesus speaks here about the door, the door that leads into the kingdom of God. It is the door of salvation. It is the door of forgiveness of sins. It is the door of peace with God. It is the door to receive eternal life. Eternal life. And he said, many are wrestling. They work hard. They strive to get through, to that, through that narrow door. And Jesus said, they will not be able to. They will not be able to. Why not? I need to tell you a little story from Germany that happened about 200 years ago when Germany got its first railway train. In those days, German women working on the farms once or twice or thrice per week took their produce to the nearest market for sale. But that was not easy. They had big baskets which they would carry on their shoulders. Before the crack of dawn, they would fill them with produce. Then they would shoulder it and they would carry it over miles to the next market, hoping to sell it and make a dime or two. But then the railway came and the one who wrote that story, I read that story, it sounds like a children's story, but he was an eyewitness. He said he was there when the train came in for the first time. And the women stood there with their baskets, their bulky baskets. And when the train stopped, they quickly opened the doors. And they wanted to get in first. But they couldn't because of that bulky basket. The one who, who wrote that story down, that eyewitness, he said, some tried it left, some tried it right. He said he saw even some try it from the back. <laughs> but too big is too big. And then came the railway inspector. When he saw these women struggle, he shouted, if you want to enter, you must unload! Unload! Somehow that little story had an effect on me when I read Luke chapter 13. Jesus said, the door into eternal life is narrow. Is narrow, but the truth is, we were all born with a basket of sin. And we have filled it up ever since. Now, I don't want to talk about sin. There are so many terrible sins. You know, there are thousands of chains, but one is enough to bind you. And there are millions of sins, and one is enough to bind you. Sin. People don't get rid of their sin. And over time it gets heavier and heavier. And the psyche can hardly bear it any longer. And depression and all sorts of things set in. I want to talk about one sin which I believe is the root sin of all. That prevents people from getting rid of that basket. It is the sin of pride. 
of arrogance. They have heard the gospel, but they are not willing to call upon the Savior to help them remove that basket to help them unload. Next to that narrow door, that narrow gate, Jesus is standing. And he's looking at us all as he is right now. He sees you struggle. You've tried so hard. It hasn't worked. Somehow, you are still a sinner in your sins. Or you're a backslider. A miserable backslider. I always call backsliders miserable. Because until today, I've never found a happy backslider. But Jesus is watching you. And I tell you what you can do now. 